Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W and our continuing discussion of Vietnam. In the previous lecture, we talked about new President Lyndon Johnson and some of his early decisions and policies regarding Vietnam. In this lecture, we're going to focus on the episode that more than any other led to America's deepening commitment and involvement in Vietnam, the Gulf of Tonkin Incident and Resolution. In August of 1964, a series of controversial incidents in the Gulf of Tonkin brought the war to a new level. This ultimately resulted in the implementation of many of the plans that the Johnson administration had contemplated but resisted implementing. It also resulted in the enactment of a congressional resolution that gave Johnson virtually unlimited resources to wage the growing war in Vietnam. On Sunday morning, August 2, 1964, three North Vietnamese torpedo boats attacked the destroyer USS Maddox engaged in the DeSoto surveillance missions, codenamed DeSoto to detect radar installations. Two days before, South Vietnamese patrol boats had launched raids on the coast as part of Operation Plan 34. The North Vietnamese assumed that the Maddox was connected to those attacks. The Maddox returned fire, badly damaging one of the North Vietnamese boats, and naval aircraft from the carrier USS Ticonderoga also attacked and damaged all three boats. The Maddox suffered only minor damage. Johnson was advised that the North Vietnamese probably linked the Maddox to some of the other attacks that had been going on. He could have withdrawn the destroyer, or discontinued the Op Plan 34 attacks altogether. He did neither. In fact, he ordered that the Maddox continue its operations, joined by another destroyer, the USS Turner Joy. In doing these things, Johnson may not have been trying to provoke a fight with the North Vietnamese, but clearly he was not trying to avoid one either. The night of August 4th was extremely rainy. The seas were rough and lightning played havoc with surveillance equipment. At about 7 p.m. that night, Captain John J. Herrick of the USS Maddox picked up a radar contact headed in that direction. Both destroyers wheeled south and moved away. Nearing 8 o'clock, both ships picked up more radar contacts and called for air support. Air support, though, didn't see anything on the water. At 9.30, both ships began firing at radar targets, blasting fire out into the stormy seas. Herrick sent word that his ship was under attack. The radar operator on the Maddox reported torpedoes in the water. For two more hours, the destroyer zigged and zagged and fired out into the night. Later that night, Herrick sent a message that he thought the attack had never happened and that his men were inexperienced and edgy and quick to fire. Perhaps the weather had interfered with his equipment. The pilots had never seen any enemy boats. Lyndon Johnson, in spite of this message, took the opportunity to enact many of the measures his administration had considered. He ordered retaliatory airstrikes against North Vietnamese targets, and he also organized support for his congressional resolution. Robert McNamara was assigned the responsibility for confirming the attacks. He dismissed the captain's message, instead relying on radio intercepts of North Vietnamese messages that seemed to confirm an attack. Later studies showed that McNamara was actually relying on radio messages of the first attack on August 2nd. Even Lyndon Johnson, a few days later, said, Hell, those dumb, stupid sailors were just shooting at flying fish. Nonetheless, when Johnson addressed the American people, he said that he had ordered the bombing of North Vietnam to retaliate for, quote, open aggression on the high seas against the United States of America. And he said, we seek no wider war. He also claimed that the attack was unprovoked, and denied that the United States was supporting the South Vietnamese military in international waters. On August 5th, the resolution was sent to Congress. It was shepherded through by William J. Fulbright, the chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee, 
a personal friend of Lyndon Johnson. Fulbright believed that Johnson didn't seek wider war and would not commit ground troops, and he worked to get it passed quickly. In committee, there were few questions raised about the attacks. McNamara testified that he had no idea why the North Vietnamese may have attacked the destroyers. This wasn't true. He knew of the covert missions and the other reasons for the attacks. One senator who challenged McNamara and the resolution was Wayne Morse of Oregon. A Pentagon source had leaked information to him about the covert operations. McNamara dismissed the claim and no one else followed up. Fulbright then guided the resolution quickly through the Senate. Within two years, he would be completely disenchanted with Lyndon Johnson's actions and feel misled. He would become one of the Senate's most noteworthy doves or peace advocates. There were a handful of questions about the resolution itself. Fulbright even indicated that the resolution would likely serve as a declaration of war should Lyndon Johnson send ground troops, but he had assurances that he wouldn't do that. Only two senators opposed the resolution, Senator Morse of Oregon and Senator Ernest Gruning of Alaska, who argued, quote, all Vietnam is not worth the life of an American boy. The United States is seeking vainly in this remote jungle to shore up self-serving corrupt dynasties or their self-imposed successors, and a people that has demonstrated that it has no will to save itself. Senator Morris denounced the Lyndon Johnson administration completely. He accused American officials of hiding information and refusing to seek a peaceful resolution. He also predicted that the war would replicate the French catastrophe and would soon involve hundreds of thousands of combat soldiers. And he said, quote, I believe that history will record that we have made a great mistake in subverting and circumventing the Constitution of the United States. Future generations will look with dismay and great disappointment upon a Congress which is now about to make such a historic mistake. Few listened to such objections. The resolution passed the Senate, 88 to 2, and the House, 416 to 0. The news media accepted official versions of the story. Editorials were positive and Lyndon Johnson's approval rating shot from 42 to 72% after the hearings. Both Senators Gruning and Morse were defeated in their next elections. The resolution is officially titled the Joint Resolution to Promote the Maintenance of International Peace and Security in Southeast Asia. It's commonly known as the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. The key language reads, quote, the Congress approves and supports the determination of the President, as Commander-in-Chief, to take all necessary measures to repel any armed attacks against the forces of the United States and to prevent further aggression. The United States is therefore prepared, as the President determines, to take all necessary steps, including the use of armed force, to assist any member or protocol state of the Southeast Asia Collective Defense Treaty, requesting assistance in defense of its freedom. The resolution was intended to send a message of support to South Vietnam and intimidation to North Vietnam. On the home front, the political impact of this Gulf of Tonkin resolution was that it essentially locked in members of Congress in their support of what would become the Vietnam War. It would become increasingly difficult for members of Congress as the years passed to voice their opposition to the war in Vietnam because they had effect voted for it with the Gulf of Tonkin of Resolution without realizing it. And so when we get to 1968 and the presidential campaign of that year, when we go looking for anti-war candidates, we won't find them in Congress. This is a declassified document that shows President Johnson in discussions with the National Security Council about the attacks in the Gulf of Tonkin. And it indicates that as a result of those attacks, Johnson is determined to escalate. If we look at the final sentence or sentences in, these, uh, in this document, it says, If yes, we should do more than merely return the fire of the attacking ships. 
If this is so, then the question involves no more than the number of North Vietnamese targets to be attacked. And as we'll see momentarily, he does set about to determine that bombing retaliations are in order for the attacks in the Gulf of Tonkin. With the authorization granted him in the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, Johnson commenced to escalate the war in Vietnam. The immediate outcome was an operation called Pierce Arrow. This was a limited bombing attack, 64 bombing runs against North Vietnamese naval bases and oil dumps. In the process, 29 Vietnamese ships were sunk, but also two American aircraft were shot down. Among them was a pilot named Lieutenant Everett Alvarez, who was captured. He became the first prisoner of war for the United States in Vietnam, and ultimately served eight and a half years as a prisoner of war. There would be many more to follow. The response from the Vietnamese was not to yield or surrender or weaken, but rather to escalate the number of troops moving south. They strengthened the Ho Chi Minh Trail, which we'll discuss in future lectures. They also sought and received support from the Chinese, who improved railroads across the border into Vietnam and began sending more supplies. And it also strengthened morale in the North and increased their resolve behind the purpose in this conflict. With the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, the Johnson administration took the Vietnam War to an unprecedented scale. While there would continue to be opportunities to withdraw and end the war after the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, they would be much more complicated than before. He had deceived the Congress and the American people. Once the deception became apparent, congressional leaders like Fulbright turned on the Lyndon Johnson administration. He had also created the provocation for the attacks. He had an opportunity to discontinue the Op Plan 34 and DeSoto missions, but he chose instead to continue both at the same time in the same region. Also, with the bombings after the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, he now brought the war to the north. The United States was now moving beyond only an advisory role, but rather assuming command of the conflict. Even considering all of the above, it must be said of Lyndon Johnson that he didn't want to be a war president. He had not pre-committed himself to this war. He hoped to concentrate on domestic issues. But his hopes hinged on two ideas, that a stable government in South Vietnam might still defeat the Viet Cong, and that Hanoi could be pressured into abandoning their hopes for a unified government. Neither hope was realized. In the next lecture, we'll continue to discuss the process of escalation in the wake of the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution.